Today, I am delighted to have Ian McMillan with me, writer, poet, broadcaster, and so much more. And I really love the playful and touching nature of Ian's work, whether it's going right back to the stories and poems and autobiography in the super fun book, Dad, the Donkey's on Fire, or whether it's more recent works like Ian's beautiful and really funny memoir, My Sun Life, My Pebble Life, which I really enjoyed. So I have so many questions for Ian about how he brings humor into his work. But before we dive in, Ian, is there anything else you want to add with regards to uh, you and your work. Oh, that sounds good to me. That sounds yeah. excellent. What a great... <laughs> Amazing. <Yeah. laughs> great. So I, I want to take you back because I, I read that you wanted to be a writer all through your school days. I'm just curious whether humour showed up early for you or if that's something that you evolved as you grew. I've been thinking about this and this okay. sounds made up, but actually it was November 1967 when I was 11 when I, real, when I wanted to start making people laugh because I was a studious kind of boy at junior mm. school and I liked, I liked reading. I liked reading kind of odd science fiction things at the same time as reading comics and I liked watching strange shows on the radio, like on the telly, I mean, like uh, The Avengers. I liked the kind of weirdness of the plots. And at the same time, I was, a, I was a, a quiet, serious boy. And I think it was around that time, there was a show on that was a precursor to Monty Python's Flying Circus called Do Not Adjust Your Set. That was a children's program that had some of the people out of Python in it. And what I liked about it was its absurdity. And people would mm. say ridiculous things. And at the same time, I was watching a bit of Spike Milligan. So we went on a school trip to London and went to the Albert Hall to see an orchestra, which was fantastic. But on the way back from the school trip, I remember thinking, this is November 1967, so I was 11, and I thought, if I say something ridiculous, it might make people laugh. So I, I remember I had some kind of pen or pencil, and I said something like, I can't remember the exact words, I said, this isn't a pencil, it's actually the feather from an ancient Chinese bird that lived for 400 years and died by eating too much porridge. And so that kind of thing, that thing just fell out of my head. And my mates laughed. Yeah. Oh, that's interesting. I, don't, I didn't quite know where that came from, that sentence. And then I started doing it all the time. I would just say ridiculous things all the time that were sort of bumping together of different kinds of language. So they bumped together the descriptive and the outlandish, the surreal and the ordinary. And I was getting laughs. I was getting kind of odd looks as well, but I was getting a lot of laughs. You know, I'd say, well, I'll just have a, I'll just have a cup of hedgehog rather than say I'll have a cup of tea. And for some reason, that rubbing together of different registers of language made people laugh. So I realised then that I could make people laugh. And it's a funny thing. And it's, it's like a, an obsession and a disease that you've got to make people laugh all the time. And if people don't laugh, for example... This afternoon, I was doing an interactive poetry event with a big gang of pensioners in my local library. They didn't realise it was interactive until I got the flip chart out and we started making things up. All the pensioners laughed, apart from one, who was sat on the third row and sat completely glum. and didn't. Well, she kind of enjoyed it, but she wasn't laughing. And I took that as my personal quest to make <laughs> right. her laugh. Right, I'm going to make you laugh, Mrs. I am going to make you laugh. There was a lady on the front row who was a bit hard of hearing, so I was able to speak loudly, and that was all right for her, but the one on the third row. And in the end, I've got to tell you, I feel she didn't laugh. She didn't laugh once. She smiled at the end and said, I enjoyed that. And so I took that as a personal affront that I could, couldn't make her laugh. I was an absolute and total failure. So it is this weird disease, I think, or, I don't know, a, a, an obsession or a, an addiction is the word. It's an addiction to making people laugh and it's just a, a weird thing that's so beautifully described there and I, I still love that you had that quest and who knows what she was thinking after you laughed I'm sure you well, still it, touched her day so it occasionally happens where somebody comes up at the end of something and goes and they haven't laughed at all they've not laughed mm. and they go I really enjoyed that <laughs> well <laughs> you're miserable why didn't you just laugh once or but then again you know some people enjoy it without laughing 
And then sometimes the opposite happens, where somebody laughs uproariously and kind of loudly, and it, what he said <laughs> wasn't all that funny. And they're yeah. laughing and they're laughing, and people around them are getting a bit miffed by the fact that these people are laughing and they can't stop laughing. And you've obviously tickled them in some way, mm. but it, it's like they've gone right over the top. And then very, very occasionally, very occasionally, I get the giggles myself, which isn't very <laughs> professional. But I remember once I was doing a thing and there was a, a lady on the front row. And as, as I'm doing the thing, she was laughing. But I thought I kept thinking, she looks like somebody. She looks like somebody. Does she look like somebody I know? Who is she? Who does she look like? And then for no reason at all, halfway through the show, she put a pair of dark glasses on and she looked just like Roy Orbison. So that made me laugh. That just made me yeah. laugh. And I was laughing. And f to start with, they're kind of sympathetic to your laughing. But after a bit, they go, I wish you'd just stop laughing. What's he laughing for? So laughter is a funny thing, as it were. Yeah. It just kind of either takes over, doesn't appear, or hangs about in the wings, waiting to suddenly bite. Huh. And I love that. And have you always, like, because you've got such a specific um memory of when you you remember like really starting to engage with that mm. did you ever question it and the the reason that i'm asking that is that i feel like there's so many delightful books that engage with wordplay and rhyme schemes and like you say different things bumping up against each other and just like relishing in language for children mm. and for young people and that adults love too and then like my memory of senior school and poetry is like humor's not allowed anywhere in the room <laughs> So did you ever question it or did, was it just this always been your personal quest? Well, uh, I was lucky enough to go to a West Riding County Primary School and the West Riding of Yorkshire between, when I, well, it finished in 1974, but it was a wonderful education authority that was run by this genius called Sir Alec Clegg, mm. God rest him, who said, all children are creative. And so at that junior school, I was I was given leave to write, to sing, to dance, to paint, to make plays. They weren't all funny at the time. But they weren't, you know, I was serious. But it made you think, well, I can be creative. I can be a creative mm. person. Those wonderful teachers. And it was just an ordinary school. It was just a school in a pit village. But it was a school where creativity was encouraged all the time, which is why I always encourage everybody to be creative. Then at secondary school, <clears throat> when I decided to be funny, we had some teachers who weren't that funny, but we had a fellow called Mr. Brown. And we can all, a lot of us can point to one particular teacher. And we were doing a book of poems, called, uh, an, an anthology called Nine Modern Poets. And Ted Hughes was in it. And I quite liked the work of Ted Hughes, but they weren't funny. But then I remember that Mr. Brown took me on one side. This is 1971. And he said, I've got a book of, I've got a book of jokes here. You like comedy. Here's a book of jokes by a comedian. And it was Ted Hughes's collection, Crow, which is a fantastic kind of viscerally violent, uh, shamanistic collection of poems about this crow. But because he said, here's some jokes, it kind of made me laugh and it made me think. And then he said, oh, by the way, you could be the editor of the school magazine. So I started writing these comedy bits for the school magazine. And he said, oh, you could, uh, we're doing a playwriting competition. Why don't you write a play? So I wrote a play that made, us, that made people laugh, you know, and... So I was encouraged by that teacher. So I've never really questioned it. You know, I've always, at times, people have said, uh, I wish you'd be a bit more serious. And I do write serious poems. Hmm. And I've always thought about that, whether you think that somehow, you must come across this a lot in this podcast, whether, hmm. you know, seriousness, whatever the seriousness is, it's more important culturally than the funny stuff. Even if hmm. the funny stuff is so much funnier and cleverer and more loving and more intimate than the serious stuff, which might just be a bit clunky and might not work so much. There's this kind of idea that if you're making people laugh, you're somehow not as clever as the ones who are making them think. So it's, it's, I've always been interested in that. I've always had those two things side by side in my head because I do love writing serious poems and reading serious poems and reading stuff that's quite hard to fathom. But at the same time, Give me a flip chat and a room full of people, and I just, I just, I laugh. It makes me laugh. You know, just having a laugh, and 
and then they relax and they come mm. along and they, they uh, that's the that's the opening isn't it you make them laugh and then you say let's write a poem I didn't think they could but they did you know so I've I've never questioned it but I've often I've often been I've been interested in why maybe other people question it and also there's mm. that thing where you do something that you think is funny and the people in the crowd don't think it's funny and that's always fascinating to me as it's happening you think oh yesterday people laughed at this the week before they laughed at it it's the same kind of group group in the same kind of room and yet they're not laughing Fasc- absolutely endlessly endlessly fascinating comedy is although i never call myself a comedian because mm. they always say oh come on then make us laugh you know i like to be i'm a writer and a poet yeah. and and then you kind of get one up on them in a sense because they don't think you're going to be funny and then when you are it's like a, it's a bonus <laughs> Uh-huh. Yeah, uh. and your work is so touching as well. And um, for example, in my son life, my pebble life, mm. there were so many stories that absolutely like creased me up. I don't want to spoil it for people that haven't read it yet. People should go and read it. But like, there was one with a potential zip wire and a life vest in oh, you rowing that. Oh my goodness, it made my sides hurt. And then there's also like incredible poignancy um, with some of the stories like set during COVID and thinking about different relatives. And I love that it embraces all that. And I actually really don't like this sort of false dichotomy that people have between Mm. uh, drama and comedy. And I see it being blended more in TV now and people Mm. are coming up with the clunky terms like dramedy and still trying to find a good way of explaining it, but not necessarily helpful labels. But I'd love to know for... Writers who do want to um, kind of grow those comedy muscles and mm. get better at like capturing and conveying funny stories like you do in your memoir and you do like within your poems and collections. Any practical places to start if they feel like that skill's a little bit underdeveloped in them? I would think, uh, and it's obvious really, but always listen. Always listen mm. to people. People are so funny. I mean, just they say ridiculous things. All the time. So yesterday I tweeted about it because, as you know, I'm always on Twitter. I tweeted about it. There was <laughs> there was two people on the bus. I was going to Doncaster to do a workshop, and this woman said, "Yes, this gentleman's got a sweet shop." And her mate said, "Yeah, he says he has." And I thought, <laughs> "Wow, there's a story. There's a story. yeah. You know, he says he's got, he's got this gentleman. Call him a gentleman. This gentleman's got a sweet shop." Uh. He says he has. And I just, I tweeted that instantly because I thought, there's a thing. So if you want to write something funny, you listen to that phrase and you Mm. you pick out the individual words. This gentleman has got a sweet shop. And you think, instantly you see the man, you see an image Mm. of him. He looks a bit like Ronnie Barker, not in all hours. Then you hear that odd phrase, he's got a sweet shop. And it's almost like, you know, it has echoes of a phrase like sweet spot and it has mm. echoes of other phrases. So when you're writing this kind of thing, you pick up the verbal and aural echoes of a word and you think, oh, yeah, that word could be that. That word could mean that. And then, uh, and, th- and this woman was kind of open and happy that this gentleman has got a sweet shop. And then her mate was a bit more cynical. He says he has. He says he has. <laughs> and the way she said it, he says he has. So says half rhymed with has, there's two he's in the sentence, he says he has. And I thought, wow, you could you could write that down. But then you think, all right, and as a comedy writer, you will go, what happens next? What happens? They get off the bus. And the cynical woman says, well, take me to his sweet shop. And the, the happy woman goes, well, it's not open today or something. And then they get to the sweet shop and it's something totally different. So I would say, you know, um, listen, observe watch the endless absurdity of real life the other thing i'd recommend to somebody is actually write with somebody else if you're writing Mm. comedy form a team years ago i wrote a detective comedy series for radio four that's still on four extra now and then called the blackburn files and there were three of us there was me and my mate martin and my mate dave sheesby and we go to dave sheesby's house and we'd write we'd pace about the room and me and Martin would come out with gags all this time. Gag, gag, gag. And Dave would be in charge of the typewriter, as it was in those days. And so he's writing it down. So he's in charge. So you type this out, and then you go gag, gag, gag. And he'd, 
at the same time he's shaping it he's he's putting it into character so you know he'd i'm trying to think of a so you do a ridiculous gag like he's a he's a mil he's a milliner well he's got a lot of hats well he's a multi-milliner you know <laughs> ridiculous gag <laughs> but then he'd yeah he'd put that in to the characters saying it and then you go home me and martin would go home and he'd ring up and say i've read it it's rubbish it is terrible what it's not funny nobody's ever going to like this so then you'd have to go back the next week and cheer him up and get him going but if you write in a team then you can fire gags off each other you can practice stuff because a lot of stuff looks good on the page but it's quite hard to say mm. that's why i liked he says he is you know that's that 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 was just so because she said it was so good to say so i'd recommend that i would recommend always these are just obvious things really but always have a notebook always have a notebook because things will occur to you and you'll forget them. All you remember is that you had an idea. And if you overhear these things and you don't tweet them or write them down straight away, they will go. And what they'll do is I would then write them down and I would let them marinate overnight, these phrases. And then I'd look at them and go, what are these characters telling us? How could I make this into maybe a half-hour thing or a stand-up routine? Or, for example, a lot of the things I used to do when I was working a lot in village halls, I used to find notices. I loved notices. Mm, and me just too. hold up this. There was a great one. This, the, their entire publicity was a notice that said, Funny Poet here on Friday. And just a beautiful. And then the best, the best one I ever found was a note that I found on a tree. And it said, Where can we go to watch people play badminton and eat our sandwiches? And it was like the word badminton was highlighted. Where can we go to watch people play badminton and eat our sandwiches? And that, again, that just set you off on all kinds of roads. Why? Well, why badminton? There's somewhere they can go and watch tennis, but why badminton? And so I would always hold it up as part of the routine. And then at the end, I go, they'll never go now because I've pinched the notice. So things like that, just little things that you see and you find and you overhear can gradually, you know, build into something. And it, it just... It, it trains you all the time mm. to be listening. It can be a bit, a bit tiring in a way. I don't find it tiring, but people said they do. That you, if you're always like listening, and as they say in Derbyshire, hanging the tab. I'm you're always hanging tab, listening. But it just, it, and it also makes you realise, you know, that the, the wonderful thing about people is that they're all different, and the wonderful thing about people is that they will often say quite pretty funny things, you know, and mm. especially if they're talking to each other. So I'd recommend that really, and. When I first started, I was just writing jokes. I used to write jokes for, there used to be a thing on Radio 4 called Week Ending, and me and my mate would write these topical gags. But because this is the days before the internet, this is way not before the internet, but like the late, the very early 80s, we had to post these gags to like by letter. So, and this meant to be a topical programme that was recorded on a Friday. So if anything funny happened on Thursday, we'd add it. If something funny happened on a Tuesday, We'd post these gags, and that that was just how I started, just just making gags with just a bit a bit of wordplay, just tiny bits, tiny little bits of wordplay. So I've always been a fan of wordplay and how it works. But what I do find is I'm not great at character. People say hmm. to me, "Do you fancy writing a novel?" And I go, "Well, no, no," because they would all be like me. That's why I enjoyed writing my sand life, my pebble life, because that was just me. That book came about because. I always swore I'd never write a book again because I've written a couple of books that I quite enjoyed, but I'm good at short stuff, at poems and stories and articles. So this Bloomsbury rang me up and said, could you write as a, an introduction to a book about the coast? It's a thousand words. I said, yeah, a thousand words, I can do that. And they said, oh, we like that, a thousand words. Do you fancy writing a book about the coast? And I'm going, no, no, no book, no book. And they're going, it's not that long, it's 50,000 words. I go, no, no, no book, no book. But then, <laughs> because I'm freelance, you end up going, well, what? And you, you go, all right, yeah. then, well, how about if I write, rather than writing 50,000 words, I write 50 1,000 word bits? And they went, oh, yeah, that's all right, you can do that. And that's how, how it, what it ended up being. And the idea was that I would go to a village hall. I did a lot of gigs in village halls pre pandemic, and I'd stay over and then go to the nearest bit of coast and write about it. But then the pandemic happened, so I, we couldn't go anywhere. If you'd have gone to the coast, it would have been weird. So I said to him, can I write 50 
memories or more or less memories. So that's why there's quite a few memories in there. So I'd, every day I'd come up to this little room that I'm in now and just sit there. And the great thing about it was, you'll know this, that, that memories pull other memories up. Mm. You know, so the, the memory of me on the, on the zip wire huh, then pulled up a different memory of something else. And they do, they like little hooks. So mm. I would recommend that as well to people, actually. Another great resource is memory. Memory is just the greatest. But then what happens is they'll write something and I'll say to them in a workshop, well, why don't you make do something there? Could that happen? Why don't that happen? They go, oh, no, it didn't happen like that. That's not what happened in real life. And you go, actually, it's not real life anymore. You know, you, you're writing it. You can, you can make things up. So, you know, you start with your memory and then you make things up. I'm sorry if I'm rambling. I'm rambling. Not at all. No, I'm fascinated. <laughs> and do you think your memory has always been this sharp and this vivid, or do you think that you've trained it again to be able to like time travel back and locate those different points and what you were holding up and who was there? And I think it, it, you do train it. You definitely train it. I think you train it through reading, through writing, through listening, through. For me, what helps is that I'm only a hundred yards, no, three or four hundred yards from where I was born. You know, so mm-hmm. I've always lived in this place. So this place knows me, and I know this place, and that helps. So I can walk down a street and think, "Oh, that's where Uncle Charlie fell down." You know, or I can get on a bus and think, "Oh, that's when that thing happened on that bus." So that helps. That does help. I think you can train. You can train your memory definitely, and then you get that thing where you think, "Is it false?" You know, as somebody actually mm. said. Remember when that happened? And you go, oh, yeah, I remember that. Like today, one of my old teachers came to this session and I said, oh, Mrs. Mrs. Burroughs it was. Mrs. Burroughs. She came to the session today. She, I said, you remember Mrs. Burroughs when Mrs. York, the school secretary, chased that goat out of the hall <laughs> with one of those long poles that they opened the windows with. And she went, it wasn't the long pole, it was a brush. And I went, do you know, in my memory, it's mm. a long pole because what had happened was one of the librarians, because the room was up this afternoon, had opened the thing with a long pole. So I said to Mrs. Burroughs, that's what Mrs. York had. And so that's interesting, isn't it? In all my, I've written about it. I've written about Mrs. Mm. York chasing this goat out of the room with this long pole. And Mrs. Burroughs remembered it being a brush. So what does that mean? I don't know what that means. I don't know what, because in the story, it's funnier that it's mm. a long pole. Yeah. So she's like, she's jousting. Yeah, the brush is quite funny, but I don't know. So yeah, I've always I've always had a, a good memory that you can kind of tickle at the edges, I suppose. You know, so you can mm-hmm. go, oh, I remember that, but actually, that bit is made up, and I think that's fine. You know, you can remember things, but then alter them a little bit to fit the story. So in the end, maybe Mrs. York didn't have one of them things, but in the story, mm. it's funnier. And Mrs. Burroughs this afternoon remembered it. There's something else. The other thing that's that's useful is I always tell people to use the real names of people because mm. when they make them up, it's obvious they've made them up. So you go, look, Mrs. York, what a perfect name for Mrs. York. I can see Mrs. York, and we can all see Mrs. York when I say Mrs. York. You know, and you go to you go to Cleck Eaton in West Yorkshire, and that sounds like it is, but if you if you make the name up and call it Cleck Udusfax, you know, it, it doesn't work. So real people's names, real places, real times, real events, but then just just turn them up a notch mm. so that a little smoke of fantasy blows through mm. them. You know, that that's worth trying, I think. That is worth trying. <laughs> yeah, I, I was amazed to see Mrs. Burroughs. I, I thought she was dead. But then <laughs> she, 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 look, she said, hello, remember me? I used to teach you. And I thought, I didn't remember her. And so I said, well, is it Mrs. Stansfield? She went, no. I said, is it Mrs. Hudson? I mean, I'm 67, so she must be in her late 70s at least, you know. And that, she says, no, it's Mrs. Burroughs. Well, it's Mrs. Burroughs, you know, and, then, and I didn't recognise her, to be honest with you. But <laughs> Maybe she was making it up. I don't know. But she was yeah. a great, one of them great West Riding teachers that just got you singing, dancing, writing books, you know. <laughs> Wonderful. And, oh, my goodness, I love that phrase, adding, like, a little smoke of fantasy. That's well, such that's a beautiful way of that's putting what, it. That's what you can do, isn't it? It just occurred to me, that phrase. But it just, that's, that's beautiful. What you, can do, isn't it? you can just add a bit of smoke of fantasy, mm. and it can do the things that smoke does. So it can kind of, 
it can set fire to the story, mm. but it can also obscure the story a little mm. bit so that, you know, because I was telling him this afternoon at this event about one of the stories in my sand life, my pebble life, about when uh, me and my mate were walking home from school and somebody told us that the pit head gear of Darfield Main Pit was Blackpool Tower that you could see through the mist. And I could see one or two people in the room kind of nodding. Oh, yeah, we remember that. So it's, it's also about, you know, a shared community, which is what I like. You know, the fact that all this gang that were at this thing this afternoon knew it. And I'm, uh, I do, I volunteer at our local museum in this village. And, you know, they all come in and they just like to tell stories of mm. things that have gone on. And so that kind of thing feeds you. But I realise that not everybody can live where they were born, you know. And do you find that when you think back on different things, that that's your um, most, like the most common lens that you access is that kind of, like you described, like a tickling sensation mm. and the smoke and fantasy. And the reason that I asked that as well is that, for example, in memoir, like there was a whole sort of clutch of memoirs at, at one time that were sort of nicknamed misery memoirs in the sense yeah. that the tone of them had just mm. this incredibly painful feel. Whereas you always seem to, by the time it ends up on the page, be able to access that beautifully, like, poignant, bittersweet spot where we can still feel the longing mm. and the loss of COVID, but it's also with these rhythms that delight and images that spark, you know, fun. And you, you seem to be able to access that really consistently on the page. Is that how it works with your memories or is that a process? Just that's how it works. I'm I'm kind of an endless optimist. I'm always optimistic. Yeah. So being optimistic helps a lot. You know, I have this kind of Panglossian view of life, despite the terrible times that we're in. And so I'm I'm always able to see the kind of broad comedy in something. Mm. But you're right. Just maybe twist it a bit, make it a bit poignant, a bit like somebody like you know some of my I like the American. Uh, essayists who used to write in the New Yorker when I was a young man I used to read the New Yorker I still do mm. but essayists like um, James Thurber who could write something that was funny and serious and also on my shelf I'm just going to get it down if I can find it uh, I got Patrick Campbell Patrick Campbell who used to be mm. on uh, he was on Call My Bluff and he wrote this amazing column for the Sunday Times that was both funny and poignant at the same time. And he was my role model. So, for example, he suffered badly from a stutter and he wrote this fantastic column about being in a, light, in a little tiny room with somebody else who stuttered. And they're both stuttering. And as they're stuttering, because they're both exhaling quite a lot, the lamp, the light in the room, because they're both very tall, starts swinging mm -hmm. between them and kind of bashing them on the head. And gosh, I thought, I wish, I wish I could write like that. So that... I've always tried to have that edge of poignancy. And it's partly to do with, I'm obsessed with sentences. I love sentences. Mm. They're one of my favourite mm. things. I, mean, I like writing poems, but as I read, there's an American short story writer called John Cheever. Again, I found him in The New Yorker. And he writes these amazing sentences. And he's, you know, he's, his sentences are astonishing. They're, they're a, bit, a bit flowery, I suppose. They're full of adjectives and adverbs, but they can be both funny and poignant at the same time. In his introduction to his collected stories, he says, I remember a time when New York was lit by a river light and almost everybody wore a hat. And I thought, mm. what a beautiful thing. Almost everybody wore a hat, not everybody. And New York was lit, lit by a river light. And, you know, when I'm doing writing workshops, I talk to people about individual words. You know, the word, this sounds stupid, but the word ah and the word the. I love those words because you go... A woman walked in a room. You go, which woman? What room? The woman walked in the room. You go, oh, yeah, that woman, that room. So it's, you kind of, if it's the, you know the woman. If it's a woman, you think, which woman's that? You know, you kind of write mm -hmm. about. So, see, so yeah, I, I, and I, I work very hard on those, these sentences when I'm writing things like My Sand Life, My Pebble Life. And when I do, I do columns, I do a column for the Yorkshire Post every week, which is based really. I try and write it like Patrick Campbell wrote his. And I write a column for the Barnsley Chronicle, which is slightly broader and more kind of comedy. And again, I'm just trying to work on the sentences 
and try and put something funny and poignant in at the same time. And it, it's, you can kind of train yourself to do it. Sometimes what you try and work against is sort of sentimentality. I, I'm mm. a very sentimental person and I, and I know I can be accused of that and that's fine. And also a kind of uh, flippant kind of fulcrum in the sentence so that you'll go gag, whoops, poignant bit. You know, you don't want to... You don't want to do it too much like that. But I would recommend Patrick Campbell. He's, he's, mm. His collected columns are called 35 Years on the Job, and it's just every week he did this column for the Sunday Times. There's a brilliant one about him and his wife driving in the Alps, and he suddenly looks out of the car, and there's an aeroplane passing him underneath because he's so high up. And, oh, wow. <laughs> and there's just a great mm. bit at the end where he goes, I, I enjoyed that holiday. I like it where I am, under the bed holding on to the floor. You know, it's just yeah. poignant and funny. And the other thing you said earlier, rhythm. Rhythm is mm. such a great thing. Rhythm in speech, rhythm in in performance, definitely, mm. but also rhythm on the page. That's partly to do with the way we speak, but also once we start putting things on the page, we can be in charge of the rhythm of the sentence or the paragraph. So I always I start from the basis of the sentence and then I move up to the paragraph. I think the paragraph can be another beautiful thing that you can work mm. with. But like with today with this gang in the library, uh, I said, we're going to make a choral, a choral event. It's going to be a choral piece. So they all had to go, a choral piece, a choral piece. This will be a choral piece. And I, I had to go, <laughs> what's it about? And they went, the library. And so it, oh my goodness. it was just it was absolutely <laughs> beautiful. It was a bloke outside setting off fireworks for some reason. So that added to it somehow. Somebody setting off fireworks. Oh, dear. Sorry. That's I'm amazing. Rambling. No, that's amazing. And I've written down those recommendations. Thank well, you. I, I just, I'm gonna, at the end, I'll sta I'm going to stand up again. Here, I'm yeah. just going to stand on this chair. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, a, moment of, a moment of jeopardy. <laughs> jeopardy, jeopardy, jeopardy. Here we go. Here we go. Here we go. Here we go. Right, I'm back. This is... Uh, it's the first Patrick Campbell book I ever got, Fat Tuesday Tales, by mm. Gunnar Mardi Gras. I've, I've covered it with plastic because it's so precious. And then I got that, and then I got this one, 35 Years on the Job, Patrick Campbell, mm. 1937 to 73. Astonishing writing, really just... And they're, they're quite short. They're about eight to 900 words, so they're not long. And there's a great one where he says... So far, I, naked, have rushed at people three times. You know, and he, <laughs> what a great opening line. You think, what, well, like, who are they? And, you know, he's, and he's just so good at beginnings and endings. So I'd recommend that to people. Find a mm. writer that you like and read them as a writer, you know, because read them as, dissect their sentences. Think, how have they done that? How have they made me laugh? How have they made me cry? What words have they used? It's to do with rhythm, it's to do with assonance, it's to do with the sound of it, it's to do with how you build those sentences. And, and you know, do it. And always, like T.S. Eliot said, always read with a notebook beside you. I, I'm quite happy to write in books. People tell me mm. off for writing in books, but I like to write in books and just underline yeah, stuff and do arrows. Because you know, that's mm -hmm. what it is. I think that shows pre that you love a book. If you love a book, you're writing it. One of my producers at The Verb, she gets really cross when I write on a book. But it just I think it's just like it's just to show that you love it. Yeah, but, I agree. But they poignant sentences are some of my favorite. Americans can do them so much better than us somehow. American writers uh, are, are just really good at making poignant sentences. I don't know what it is. Partly I think again to do with place names. You know, they their place names have got such rhythm, you know, like uh, Wichita Lineman, that great song, mm. wouldn't work so well if it was Rotherham. You know, uh, uh, <laughs> you know, and, and you think Rotherham Lineman, Wichita, it's partly because we have this romantic image of it. But yeah, I would recommend dissecting anything you read. And, and the writer won't mind that. The writer will be really pleased. If you can talk to a writer, if ever I interview writers and ask them detailed questions about their writing, they're always pleased because people don't often ask them that, you know. 
I think that's lovely. And it's so inspiring hearing the way that you talk about sentences and paragraphs because I think again if your experience of poetry like most of mine is still from school like Mm. I'm super passionate about fiction and very interested in other forms and I've been reading a lot more poetry in the last year because I've been taking the Ray Bradbury challenge to read a poem a short story and an essay every night so then it like deposits like pomegranate seeds in you and fruit so but previously I I had um like I was very drawn to like work like yours or Mm. Wendy Cope or Pam Mm. things that I know Mm. how to access and other poems I've struggled with. And I think some of it is because of the way that it's taught and even things like sentences and paragraphs become things of grammar, Mm. which is, is important and is beautiful, but then sometimes it doesn't feel like it's the beauty that's attached to it. It feels like it's the mechanics and you're able to do all of it, to have the craft and to have, like, it gets me so excited to think about sentences and paragraphs the way you talk about it. Well, it's, it, and it, it's a shame that these days school education is the opposite to what I had, you know, because we were, we were taught grammar through the example of writers. And we looked at writers. And we weren't told that these were particular kinds of words, but we, we knew how they worked rhythmically. And I think it's a real shame that young children are being maybe put off the gorgeousness of language mm. by being tested on it you know it's it's a shame and people should always find their own way into language you know i i don't mind i don't mind what i call variant spelling i don't mind if things are spelt wrong i mean i'm so interested in language change the one that i've noticed Mm. recently that i find really interesting is the way that peak as in i'll have a sneak peak Mm. spelling has altered so now it's it's peak as in p-w-e-k has become Mm. p-e-a-k as oh. in the peak of a mountain. I'll have a sneak oh. peak. You'll see, have a look, in all kinds of, in press releases, in official documents, in okay. adverts, sneak peak. And people are getting cross and going, it should be sneak peak. And I go, you're not going to stop it. You know, language, that's what language does. That's the great thing about language. And if we as writers have got that, you know, we can we can do what we want with language. We absolutely can. A lot of the time I quite like reading strange, unfathomable poems that I can't understand, partly because these people are really having a great time with language. But I'm interested in language change, in the way that the apostrophe, Mm. I think, is dying out. Uh, Good. Uh, And I think things like sneak peek, you think, well, where's that come from? And it's so interesting that it's there. People get very cross about apostrophes. And I always always say, I I did a song with me and my mate, used to village halls, a song called Apostrophe Amnesty Day. When I said, look, right. today's apostrophe amnesty day, put them where you like. And we wrote we had this song that went, it's apostrophe amnesty day, throw in a comma, don't let it get in the way. And then all the audience had to join in. And you could see the ones that were joining in and going, I don't know, this isn't right. Yeah. <laughs> you know, you get genuinely on Twitter people going, I'm going to kill them because they put the apostrophe in the wrong place. And you think, well, you know, I always think, get a life, frankly, because... In the end, language will go its own way. And, and you know, mm. King Canute trying to stop language, it's not going to happen, I don't think. No, and I, I, oh, goodness, I have so many questions I want to ask you, but I want to be respectful of your time. So I'm going to ask you no, one, last, no, no. one last craft-based question, right. which is um, just you mentioned in your interactive um, project that it's focused around Elvis. Oh, um, Elvis for example, yeah. I also love music and I, I have books of song lyrics of my favourite writers because I also really love song lyrics again I find mm. them like an accessible way in and I love um some of the imagery and all kinds of things and I can I find it easier to hear them I don't think well, my ear is just like nowhere near as developed as you being able to hear a poem and see a poem and translate that process well so I'd love to know like why you're using um music in the interactive project or well, focusing I, on Elvis I've done a lot of I've done such a lot of work with musicians over the years you know I've written mm musicals i've written lyrics for songs i've written operas and i just love that place where words and music meet it's mm. such a such an interesting place where you know the the musician can take a, a line that's maybe not that inspiring and make it better uh, the thing i've just done i've just translated uh, the barber of seville into yorkshire dialect which was a fascinating project wow uh, because there's an existing English translation in standard English, and I've been interested in dialect operas for a while. I wrote one a few years ago, and so I had to take the existing English translation and 
translating to Yorkshire, but I wasn't allowed any more words because mm. it already fitted the song, the arias and the choruses. So that was such a craft-based task. I had to, I wasn't allowed that. I thought if there's one more syllable, if there's one more syllable here, I could do a great gag, but I couldn't. So I'm fascinated by that mixture of words and music. Me and my mate Luke would write instant songs with an audience, you know, and I just, that meeting of words and music is great for me. The Elvis thing is just a kind of absurd thing where at my local museum on Saturday, we're doing this interactive Elvis event where we pretend that Elvis actually came to Barnsley. They say that he landed in Scotland in 1957. He didn't. He landed in Barnsley, pretending. And so we're going to meet in a museum. I'm going to tell him he landed in Barnsley. Some gullible people will believe this. I'm then going to take him across to the local church hall, which is the old cinema, and say this is where they show Blue Hawaii. And he went to see it and actually stood up and interrupted the film. And then we're going to go down the churchyard and find some of his, the graves of his ancestors down the churchyard. And then, in a wonderful meeting of words and music, we're going to go back to the museum and I'm going to pretend that I've discovered that every Elvis song can be sung to the tune of Il Climur Bar Tat. So I'm going to get the assembled crowd. And in fact, it's true. So if we can sing, Well, bless me soul, what's wrong with me? Wrong with me? I'm itching like a man in a buzzy tree. I am all <laughs> shook up, all shook up. And that's just a, a kind of absurd <laughs> thing. We, we like to do ab absurd events at the, at the museum. And that's just, for me, it'll be like a one-hour-long improv in a way just improvising about Elvis and then it'll culminate with me and this guy Richard playing the guitar and we'll sing a bit of Elvis and so I've always always been interested in the meeting of words and music and I'd like to do more of it you know and, and me and my mate Luke have been writing words and, and, and music and what was nice the thing I used to like doing best was just making up a song so we get the audience to give us a few words, and they'd shout out words. This is in the village halls. And then he would start a riff. And then this was a kind of process beyond thought, a kind of improvisatory mm. process, where you open your mouth, and because it's got a rhythm, and because you think I'm going to make this rhyme, then mm. you come out with this thing. And I had no idea where it was coming from. And if you suddenly started thinking about it, you think, I sound ridiculous. You would then stop. And then people would go, oh, you must have made that up before. And I go... I didn't, and it was something. Sometimes I had to convince him. <laughs> but yes, that's the interactive Elvis tour of Darfield. <laughs> oh my goodness, that sounds extraordinary. It will be. <laughs> well, the other thing I did, I must tell you, is that um, the museum itself. I always tell people it's the only museum in the world named after a gay cross-dressing ex-marine who was the great Morris Dobson. It's the Morris Dobson Memorial Heritage Centre. Morris Dobson and his partner Fred with that rare thing, an out gay couple in the 60s in a pit village in Barnsley, and they had a corner shop. And Morris was like a character from a no coward play, and he, he wore a blue powder blue suit, and he had a cigarette in a holder, and he was very camp. His partner, Fred, was less so. And they had a swearing parrot. They used to swear <laughs> when people went in. So eventually, when Morris died, he gave the corner shop to the local amenities group, uh, as a museum. So for the last 20 years, it's been a museum. So last year, on April Fool's Day, we did this stunt where I said, we published it in the local paper, we said we found some jars down in the cellar that through obscure, what do we call it? Obscure recording techniques actually contain the voices of Morris and Fred, who died in 1977, and we have a jar with the parrot in it. And people oh believed it. This, this local councillor went, is it true? I said, yes, it's true. We invited them all to the Great Unscrewing, where this thing we called the Great Unscrewing, and, it was, and they all sat round. And my mate was playing, like, portentous music on the squeeze box. And then I said, we're going to open the first one, open the first one. And this was like Morris and Fred singing. And I opened it, nothing happened. And he was like, oh. And he went, well, well. And I said, well, the second one. And we, we unscrewed it. And the audience had to shout, unscrew the jar. And we unscrewed the jar, and nothing happened. And then we got to the third one. The parrot swear him, and nothing happened again. It was just the most beautiful, poignant thing. So yeah, we we like to do absurd events at the uh, Norris Dobson Museum. I love it. Oh <laughs> my goodness! So much fun. So much fun. Oh, <laughs> yeah, I I feel like I've I've had a little trip myself. 
Like, oh, you can imagine that so clearly. That's awesome. Well, if, you're ever, if you're ever around this way, come and see us. We're open Saturdays and Wednesdays, and uh, it is quite a remarkable, remarkable place, I've got to say. In fact, we have a couple of people who are such fans of it. There's a friend of mine who lives in Nottingham who comes up at least once a month just to be in this jazz place where people just talk and, and things happen, and it's just a bit ridiculous. But uh, <laughs> Beautiful. M- memorable and oh my goodness that's well and for lots of people listen from um the u.s to this podcast as well so if you're not lucky enough to come to the museum then definitely um i highly recommend all of ian's books and uh, there's lots of ways to listen to you online as well but ian where would you like people to go to find you who uh, haven't had that lovely experience before where should they go but- to find you Online. I would say I would say go to my Twitter, which is mm. at I'm Millen, because I just tweet endlessly all the time. But yeah. I get up very early in the morning and go draw, so I tweet about that. Also, I have a, a website, uh, ian dash mcmillan dot co dot uk, and my Radio Three show, The Verb, it was on BBC Sounds. But Twitter, Twitter is often the best place to find me because I'm there all the time. I'm always there, perhaps too okay. much. I- I'm going to have to ask you, I, I said no more questions, but just one last question, because mm-hmm. I feel like there's quite a lot of um, anti-Twitter sentiment um, mm. in the writing community at the minute. Yeah. And I love that you still love it. Like, is that because you're an optimist, because you love yeah. the brevity of the form, you connect with people? What, what do you love? Because it's nice to hear a different take. All, all those three. It's because I'm an optimist. It's because my little kind end of Twitter doesn't seem to get the horror other places do i know there can be nastiness but i'm honestly i'm not kidding when i say maybe i've had two or three nasty tweets this place do you know miranda keeling she does the most no. beautiful tweets just little observation tweets oh, uh, moose okay. Ale- uh, miranda keeling she did a book yeah. of her well worth looking at and moose alain i like mm. moose like the animal and a double l a i n he'd be very good for this podcast he's a cartoonist he does the most oh, beautiful, wonderful. the most beautiful tweets. Like um, he gets, he gets what Twitter can be. So he put like, uh, mm. I couldn't get my trousers off, so I had to have an emergency trachybotomy. You know what a clever <laughs> gag that is. And then uh, yeah. I made a, I made a model of Everest. Was it to scale? No, just to look at. You no, know, beautiful, oh. almost poems. Yeah. So, so that's why that's why I like that. I like the brevity of it, but I also mm. like the way it forces me. It forces me to be creative so that mm. in the morning I get up at five o'clock and I tweet my pre-stroll tweet. So I tweet something that I've just thought of as I get up, often a gag or an observation. Then I go on my early morning stroll and I'll, I train myself. It's always the same walk around the village, always the same walk. And I train myself to see five different things. So I, mm. I put those in the tweet. And if I don't tweet, if sometimes I'm doing something else, I tell people in advance, and if I don't, if I don't tell them, they think I'm dead or they think something's happened. And then I always tweet, <laughs> I always have my first cup of tea, and I try and tweet something beautiful about my first cup of tea. And all the time, I want people to go, I could do that. That's what all I ever want people to go, I could have a go at that. So yeah, Twitter, find me on Twitter. Don't, there's another Ian McMillan who gets quite grumpy, and he has to put, I'm not <laughs> Ian McMillan, the writer. He's some fellow, I think he's a plumber from uh, Scotland somewhere, <laughs> but he's, he's, he's a different spelling. So yes, come and see me on Twitter. I'm always there. I love it. And thank you so much, Ian. I feel like you've literally like rewired parts of my brain in the most beautiful way and given me such um, an inspiring way to walk out of the door and re-engage with life. So thank you so much. I really appreciate your insights.